Hey everybody, while I got a few minutes here, I'm going to knock two things off of my to-do list with one video here. There is a YouTube channel I want to share, and I'll get to that in just a second, but the subject of the Orkney Islands in Scotland has been brought up, and I have only made one video on that area, and I did not talk on that video. That was one of my videos where I just zoomed in on Google Earth, showed you around, and then backed out. And I know people would rather, I've had just a few comments saying, you know, I wish you would talk on these videos, but I like doing videos like that where I just put it to music and show you around and back out because that lets you put in your mind's eye where a place is on earth and it forces you to make the story up in your own mind. You don't need to listen to me babble on every video. But in case you're new to my channel, I do some videos like that where I don't talk and I just show you around and you need to tell yourself what the story is by what you're seeing. And some sites, I have no idea what the story is. So I just wanted to mention that. But the Orkney Islands, and this is a very important site, and I'm going to talk about it today just briefly and then share a video at the end. But we are zooming into very northern Scotland here. And this is a very important place because there has been some videos done. I think the BBC was one and National Geographic did an article on this titled uh, Before Stonehenge. And it was a very important article and a very well done article. But here we are going down to the Ness of Brogdar. And I'm just going to show you a few sites. We have some standing stones. And this is a 5,000 year old site. This comes from the same time as the first dynasty of Egypt. And also, by the way, the start of the Mayan calendar. So why do these civilizations seem to pop up and start at this time? Or are they just restarting at this specific time about 5,000 years ago? Because these sites seem to be important and the first dynasty in Egypt, beginning of the Mayan calendar, maybe something is happening that forces civilization to restart many times. And this is just one of those times 5,000 years ago. But I believe those were called the Stena stones here. And we're going to go down to one more site real quick before we get up to the main archaeological place here. But this 5,000 years ago, I imagine in the winter, it's just brutal on this waterway but here is one main standing stone i imagine this weighs on my best estimate maybe about 30 tons we're gonna go travel up the way here and i just can't imagine in the winter how cold this would be but this was a place that people were erecting what looked like houses and living here 5,000 years ago, 800 years before the standard model history says Stonehenge was built. But here, Google Street View gives you an excellent look right in the middle of this 5,000 year old site. And I'm going to show you a few pictures of this, but some work has been done. And the channel that I wanted to share has a video on this site, so this is perfect. I can include that in the end of the video. And it's mainly just on archaeology and how it's done and what they have found here. It's, you know, not the most scintillating, exciting stuff, but archaeological work is very important when putting together the pieces of ancient history. But this is a site I'm going to show you. And, oh, I gotta take a drink of coffee. My mouth is just sandpaper right now. But we're gonna travel further up this roadway. And if you have any comments, or if you happen to be familiar with this area, please leave it in the comments section. I have not done a lot of research on this area, but enough to know that this is a very important site as important maybe as Stonehenge and the article states that but this is the famous ring of Brogdar a huge megalithic ring and we still have a lot of the standing stones remaining but this was a very important site surely they were uh, viewing the stars 
doing calculations just as other cultures were. I just wanted to show you that. But that is the Ness of Brogdar, a very important site, as old as the earliest dynasties of Egypt, and comes from the same time as the beginning of the Mayan calendar. Now, I just want to jump over to a website real quick. Now, this is the Daily Mail, and this is entitled Discovery of a Lifetime 800 Years Older Than Stonehenge. It says a 5,000-year-old temple in Orkney could be more important than Stonehenge, according to archaeologists. The site, known as the Ness of Brogdar, was investigated by the BBC Two documentary A History of Ancient Britain, with presenter Neil Oliver describing it as the discovery of a lifetime. So far, the remains of 14 Stone Age buildings have been excavated, but thermal geophysics technology has revealed that there are 100 altogether forming a kind of temple precinct. And I'm not going to read this whole article, but I'll leave the link below. Here's a picture of that archaeological site. Again, where it's located. But I just find this fascinating. And here is the Ring of Brogdar, one of the uh, more impressive megalithic stone circles that we find in the UK today. Now here is the channel I want to share. It's called Recording Archaeology. They make all their videos shareable, which is really cool. They have videos on many different archaeological sites. And these are just videos of conferences, of what they have found at the sites. And I think there is some uh, really cool work being done in this field. So I just wanted to share this channel. And here is their video. Just a brief part of it, the introduction to it, and I'll leave the full link below. But hope you thought this video was interesting, and I need some more coffee, and you all have a very nice day. Thank you for inviting me to come and speak. Uh, today I'm going to talk for the next 20 minutes or so uh, on this. It's very much a pilot project at this stage, just to kind of introduce you to the aims of the project and some of the initial observations, if you like. Uh, daily activities and resource use in Neolithic Orkney microarchaeology at the Nessa Broadcare. Now I'm sure this is a, a site that probably doesn't need uh, too much introduction for most of you. Uh, it's located obviously uh, up in Orkney, uh, mainland Orkney. Uh, near to the, the town of Stromness, out here on the peninsula. Um, it's part of uh, the Ring of Brodka World Heritage Site. Uh, and excavations have actually been, go uh, actually been going on there for, for quite a number of years, but kind of gained momentum, if you like, uh, quite recently, uh, due to a lot of the kind of exceptional uh, architecture and finds that have been uncovered. Uh, and in that aerial photograph there, you could just see the main excavation area. So the excavation is actually kind of divided into two main areas. We've got the the trench here that you've probably seen in a lot of the, uh, the kind of uh, the National Geographic issue uh, and the photographs and not, whatnot, where we've got all of the, the beautiful standing architecture and buildings and a lot of the, the fantastic finds that have come out of there. But we've also got Trench T, which has been uh, excavated over the past couple of years as well. And I'm actually looking at, at both parts of the site, and I'll kind of uh, do a little bit of comparison between those uh, as we go along. So just uh, in a little bit more detail, you can see the main excavation area. This particular building is the one that you might have uh, heard quite a lot about. It's actually uh, Structure 10, quite an exceptional uh, so-called monumental building, 25 metres long by 20 metres wide, 4 metre thick outer walls that are still standing uh, to a height of about 1 metre. Absolutely fantastic uh, place to work. Also very well preserved floor deposits and hearths and things uh, there as well. Uh, so uh, as you um, may be aware, it was featured in National Geographic a few months ago. Uh, perhaps on the basis uh, of some of these fantastic finds uh, that we've uh, recovered at the site, uh, things like this decorated stone, absolutely beautiful uh, painted uh, stone materials as well, beautiful uh, carved stone balls uh, and figurines and things as well. Uh, I'm not actually going to talk to you about any of the, uh, the kind of prettiest stuff, uh, shall we say. What I'm going to talk to you about today is uh, the rubbish, uh, the midden deposits um, at the Nessa Broadcare. So in addition to the, the really well-preserved architecture, we actually have a fantastic preservation of the midden deposits, so the, the rubbish heaps at the site um, as well. And I'm quite, a, as I'm sure as archaeologists, many of you are, quite a fan um, of rubbish deposits in archaeology because they can tell us um, a lot about resource use and activities that are going on uh, within uh, the settlements. 
And the reason that middens are so important is because they provide kind of this, this archive uh, for looking at how humans have interacted with the environment and with the landscape. And this project is very much concerned with how people are, are kind of using resources in the landscape. So there's kind of two-way relationship, if you like, how people are actually having a, uh, using resources and having an impact on the environment, but also how the availability of things uh, within the landscape is actually impacting what people can do. And as part of the longer term aims of this project, we're also hoping to do more comparative work with uh, the rest of Scotland, but also with southern Britain as well, places like Durrington Walls, where we also have uh, quite well preserved midden deposits as well. Thinking about the resources that are available in either northern versus southern Britain and how that influences what people are doing uh, and the sorts of uh, technologies that are developing as well. And this particular project that I'm talking about today is particularly focusing on fuel use. Uh, as a kind of indicator for environmental relationships. So what types of fuels were people actually using? Uh, were people using different types of fuels for different activities? Were different types of fuels perhaps being used at different types of the year or perhaps for different activities? So the first thing that I think uh, we might think of as archaeologists, fuel use in the archaeological record uh, is wood charcoal. Obviously it's a major source uh, of information when we want to understand what people are burning. But as we also know, there are a lot of taphonomic problems with just studying wood charcoal. Uh, even during its period of use, uh, charcoal is only representing quite a small fraction of what people were burning. It's transformed very readily to ash. Uh, so when we're just looking at the charcoal, it's only telling us about a very small fraction. And also we've got the, the preservation uh, issues with charcoal as well. Uh, in addition to that, and particularly relevant obviously for the Scottish uh, and the Orkney context, is people were burning other things apart from wood. Uh, peat obviously being very important and other Neolithic sites uh, um, kind of in other parts of the world as well we see uh, animal dung is actually a very important source of fuel uh, and other sorts of materials grasses and reeds and things were also used as fuel so how do we actually approach the study of these types of materials and that is uh, where my own specialism comes in uh, kind of microarchaeology a sort of subset of geoarchaeology if you like it's kind of a catch-all term to describe uh, anything that is invisible to the naked eye, kind of uh, under, the, under the microscope, if you like. Uh, this integration of microscopic uh, and geochemical methods. And here's just some examples of different types of ash deposits under the microscope. So you've got kind of reeds uh, and grasses here. We've got a wood fuel with some reeds in it as well. And again, some reed microfossils uh, there as well. So it's a very uh, powerful tool to look at uh, deposits which appear quite either invisible or quite homogenous to the naked eye. Uh, so the main technique that we've been using uh, uh, up at the Nessa Broadcare is thin section micromorphology, uh, not a technique that might not be familiar to a lot of you. Uh, this is a, a technique whereby we, we cut blocks of sediment uh, out of a section and take those back to the lab, set them in resin, and then we can cut a very thin slice from that and turn it into these things, uh, these microscope slides. So you can kind of zoom into the section, if you like, under the microscope to actually look at some of these uh, finely stratified deposits or things that, which might be difficult to identify by eye. So I always like to describe it as being, ooh, it's falling over there, um, an excavation under the microscope. So it's able, letting us take our section, if you like, and look at it under the microscope and kind of zoom in. So it's more than just actually looking at things in very high resolution. It's also a very useful linking tool to look at the relationships uh, between uh, different types of material. So thinking back to the example of charcoal, what of often happens, obviously, we do sieving, we do flotation. Someone gets the charcoal, someone gets the lithic, someone gets the pottery. Um, it's actually quite important, as you know, to try and bring these materials back together to in actually interpret the deposits. And micromorphology is a really good way of doing this because you can see in this example here, you can see all of these little black deposits, this microcharcoal. You can actually see the relationship between the different classes of materials. It's very powerful in terms of actually determining what type of activity we have. Uh, so in terms of fuel, whether it's a domestic fuel deposit, whether it's redeposited, whether it's a so-called kind of industrial type activity related to pottery production or something like that. Uh, and alongside the microscopic analysis, I'm just going to briefly mention it's not something that we started yet, but we've got plans to do this in the future, is to integrate uh, the geochemical analysis as well, uh, using techniques that are kind of developed to identify the, the origins of things like uh, volcanic ash. We can actually apply these to archaeology as well, to again, to try and get a, a kind of more detail about where different ash deposits are coming from in terms of fuel types. And just as a, a comparative example, uh, to kind of show you where this, this method uh, has been developed, or a lot of this method has been developed, um, a site that I worked on a number of years ago, another Neolithic site uh, a lot earlier, Chathalhuyuk in Turkey. 
just to kind of give you the, le the level of inf information that we can get from this integrated approach, and you can see here is a, a thin section slide. This is 15 centimeters of stratigraphy, and you can already see the level of detail. And to think back to that idea of actually linking different lines of information, you can see we can look at our charcoal in conjunction with our ash deposits, and in this particular case, also look at the uh, embedded clay deposits as well. And this is a, a really good example of uh, how we can identify pottery production, um, uh, actual kiln deposits where we don't have things like slags and wasters uh, in the early Neolithic. And this is uh, showing that in this particular case, people were deliberately selecting animal dung uh, as a fuel for this particular activity. And that's quite different to what we see uh, in things like domestic hearths uh, and whatnot at that site. So these are the sorts of methods uh, that we're piloting um, at the Nessa Brodka. So we've been uh, working there for a couple of years I actually collected a, a huge amount of samples, about 60 samples, which is quite a, a significant number of large thin sections uh, in 2013 and 2014. Um, so as I said, uh, we've got samples from the main excavation area in Trench P, but also uh, Trench T, which I'll come back to in a moment. And the idea is to not just kind of look at the site as a whole, but trying to look at spatial variation within the settlement as well. Obviously, it's a, it's a, a very large site. We've got lots of different midden deposits. So it's also a really good opportunity to try and compare what's going on in different parts of the site uh, in terms of different activities that might be going on and whether they're perhaps linked uh, to different buildings and different uh, activities within buildings as well. So there's the... Uh, the, the three main midden areas that we're focusing on um, at the moment. We've got central, midden, and two kind of